Well, welcome to the third breakout session of this year's Winter Conference. Grab a seat. Um, that's a great setup uh, for our next speaker. Uh, Jimmy Emmons is, you saw him earlier, he's a board member of the, uh, the No-Till on the Plains group. He's just recently become that, but Jimmy's been involved in this uh, organization for quite some time. I think I first heard him as a speaker in the late 90s. So, um, But what he's going to talk about today is uh, what he has been doing with cover crops. Jimmy Emmons uh, farms about 2,000 acres in Dewey County, Oklahoma. Uh, that farm includes rotations of wheat, irrigated dairy, alfalfa hay, wheat, canola, and uh, he also has a cow-calf operation. He started working with, uh, with cover crops for a number of reasons in 2012. He was interested in what they do in terms of uh, the soil quality, obviously, uh, how he might be able to work them into his cattle operation, but most importantly, what they might be able to do for, uh, for water retention. So um, please welcome Jimmy and enjoy his conversation, uh, improving water retention with cover crops. Thanks a lot. How's everyone today? Tired yet? No? Fired up yet? Excited yet? Okay. How many of you are having fun farming today? All right. Honestly? Okay, great. Great. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today is how I've been able to put fun back into farming. And this is my wife. Ginger with me here in the picture, vital part of the operation. She's actually with me today, which is a rarity. Normally someone has to stay home and do all the work, and, and you all heard me talk about that before. Ginger and I really are excited about little Owen. He's our grandson. And I said this yesterday, in life we all have influences, and we have an opportunity to influence people. And a lot of times in agriculture, we do a bad job overall in promoting our youth. And I believe we're, we're missing an opportunity there. Whether Owen stays in agriculture and comes back and farms with me doesn't really matter to me as long as he's happy. But if he doesn't, and my son went to the medical field, you know, my son Bo now is a consumer and lives in the city. But when he goes to the grocery store or the doctor, he has a great story to tell about dad and granddad at the farm. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that we can have on influence and we do have to get the next generation educated about what we're doing. We, we do a bad job telling our story. I wish I could tell you this is what my soil looks like in Oklahoma. It's a slightly different color than that. We've made great strides but it, this is the definition of soil health. That's what I live and work for every day. Ginger gets a little aggravated once in a while when I'm watching videos uh, while we're watching a movie. I'm on my phone looking. But this is what I strive for. I work really hard at trying to get to this. And, and you can see that the capacity of the soil, the function of living vital ecosystem. I mean, what's happening below the ground and, I heard Ray talking earlier today how important it is that we pay attention to what's going on below the ground. And I'll, I've never been more enthused about that because early on in my career, in my life, we thought very little about what was below the ground. Now, I'm one of them big heavy sinners that I grew up in a moldboard plow situation. My granddad was a heavy cotton farmer. So we were very clean till. My dad followed in them footsteps. But I often say this, that I truly believe that my granddad and my dad never intended to degrade the system as we've grown to know that they have. Because they done the best they could do with the technology they had. My granddad could have never planted into the residue that I'm planting with because back then there was no equipment. So I give them credit for doing the best they could do, now let's do the best we can do. 
with the technology and equipment we have. So when I started this project five years ago, I was very energized. And when I wanted to start, I decided I can't do this on my own. And some of my partners are here today, and I'm, I'm happy to see that. So I put together a team, and you can see that there on the sign. USDA, very, very uh, important part. Conservation Commission, Conservation Districts. Ooh, Bank 7. How many of y'all have a banker? How many of you involve your banker in your systems at, at your farm? It's pretty important. One of the neat things about Bank 7 is my banker's name's Frank, and I always call him Banker Frank. I give him a hard time. And, and I have to nowadays because he's been under a little stress because we're under stress in agriculture. I'm proud to say now since I started this project, Banker Frank is also in the cover crop. He's also advising clients. You need to go look at Jimmy's. You need to be paying attention because I see benefit. You know, that's, it's easier to go in and ask Frank for a loan now because he gets the system. This is our first field day. And, it, and this here is one of them spots, and, and some of y'all that have saw me before, you've seen this, but it's a, it's a very interesting spot. This was in the drought. This is the year that we had nine inches of rain. This is one of the first cover crops I planted. Now we planted through this spot, and as it's coming up, one well, of my partner said, well, you didn't leave a check strip. So we took a weed eater, we weed eat it off. This is in a failed wheat scenario, so there was no stubble that year. Like I said, we had hardly any rain. But my partner's there on the, right here, that's the extension, there's a soil scientist, there's a commission, there's my district secretary, got lots of partners. There's a moisture probe there, and right here is a temperature probe where the flag is. There's one behind Colita out here. Now, I will tell you that that cover crop never got above my waist. It literally burned up. And the old saying is, if it doesn't rain, it doesn't matter. Well, it does, because we were very successful in what we've done here. In the spring, now, we, we kill that and planted wheat back that fall. Another partner of mine, Jim Johnston here with the Noble Foundation came out and immediately he looked at that square. Now remember that square? Look right here, it's plain as day. Jim said, what's going on? Now remember how important I told you the team was? I said, I don't know, Jim. There's no difference there other than a cover crop all around it. So immediately he went to the pickup, got a soil probe, come out there and probed it down. He said, huh, you got a hard pan. No, I don't, Jim. He said, yeah, it, it, I'm feeling a restriction down about 16 inches, 15, 16 inches. No, I, I know the profile here, I've dug. So he went outside that circle and everywhere outside that circle, the probe went all the way in. Now Jim says, hmm. Hmm. So he comes back inside the square, pulls it down, hits the restriction, pulls it up, looks at the bottom. You know what's on the bottom? It's dry dirt. And immediately he said, and this is another slide a little bit later, you can continue to see the, the square there. He said, we need to have your other partner, NRCS, come, and we need to look. But first of all, let's go and let's look at the probes and see what they're saying. If you look there, the green line is the cover crop. Blue line or purple line is uh, the stubble. You can see the difference in the moisture. Where the check is, that's a rain event. But look at the, look at the water we've done lost there. We got about a half inch of rain, but it still didn't matter because we're short. But look what's happening at the temperature. As we're going along, we start bumping 100 degrees Look at that, that top line. That's the, that's the bare dirt out there. Here's the actual air temperature right here. Now, 
I often tell about, man, it's so easy and, and we're very thankful when it's raining and it's so easy to see rain coming down. But it is so dang hard to see it going up. And when your soil goes to heating up and you're getting over 120 degrees, that evaporation rate is going out the roof. And every day you're losing precious rain. In western Oklahoma, where I'm from, we have to save every drop. Every drop. So, and I've seen Steve here a while ago. Where are you at, Steve? Right there. That's my state soil scientist, Steve Allspaw. We pulled these cores and come down and look, and lo and behold, what was happening, where Jim was hitting the dry dirt, sure enough, in the bare soil, 16 inches. That's, where, that's, that's all the water there was in the, in the profile. But look outside the cover, in the cover crop, 33 inches. Now we're in a drought, the big drought that we had there that was as, probably as large a drought since my granddad saw in the 30s. He came to this farm in 1926 from Texas. So when we talk about cover crops using water, yeah, we're going to use some water, but water retention, water infiltration is the key. And you've got to keep that in mind because too often over the years, we've done a great job of diverting the resource. After the 30s, what did we do? We built shelter belts to divert the wind. We built diversion terraces to divert the water and waterways to get rid of it, get it out of the field. Safely, we thought, but it's still getting rid of it. I think we missed the key back then. We should have been working at how to get it in the soil and keep it in the soil. Now, you'll see, still see the square there. We did get a little rain and we averaged 32 bushels in, in the field that year. Very blessed on that limited rainfall. But look at the difference in that square. still see it just as plain as day. So my other partner, my local conservation district guy, my CD, or district contra, a DC, I mean, he, uh, he came out and he said, Jimmy, we need to do a, a very scientific test. I said, how are we gonna do that, Paul? And he said, I want you to walk inside the square, close your eyes, bend down, and grab a head. Do that three times. I'm gonna do that outside the square. Look at the difference in the size of the heads. I will tell you that my neighbors that year harvested, their average was 20 to 22 bushels. I was at 32 bushels. The only difference there is the cover crop in a drought. Something to think about. So we, we weighed the cores, we dried them out in the lab, and lo and behold, look what it, what it proved. No cover, we was at 4.5 inches. Where the cover was, we're at 7.2. Wow. How could that be? Now we heard Ray talk earlier today from a scientific side of it, and yeah, we know now what's happening. We got better infiltration. So that got us to thinking, you know, how, how do we improve on that? The coming year, Steve and I had talked. Darren Mills is here somewhere. Where's Darren? He's a sure crop upper. He's my crop consultant. A great, great guy. has been a great benefit to me. So what did we want to do? Instead of leaving a little square, we're going to leave a 30-foot strip clear through the field. Now, we talk about pain. That is very painful. When you, when you believe in the system and you believe so passionately what you're doing to leave that bigger strip out, that's hard for Jimmy. It's very hard because I know now what the data is telling me. But if I'm going to come and I'm going to talk to all you wonderful people today, I want to be able to share some real data that has some, some backbone to it so that when I say, we're growing cover crops and at the end of the season, 
where moisture ahead that you can't save. <clears throat> that just happens at Jimmy's farm. And that's just what he thinks. But it's not, because here's the data. Now this year we're pulling multiple cores twice a year. So you'll see over here, the blue is in September 30th, is when we pull the cores. February 22nd is when we pull the last set of cores. Now I will tell you that we grazed that, that cover crop through the summer. So I'll let that grow about 40 days, 42 days, and then we run a set of cattle through it in an intensive grazing program. Rotational grazing. So we did use about three inches of water. So I'm not lying to you when we talk about where we use water, where we don't use water. Where we use it is the longer you let that cover crop go, and you graze it, some of it goes into reproductive mode. When that goes into reproductive mode, we're going to use water. And I'm going to show you some data on the cattle here in a little bit that will help offset that. But look what happened when we come to February 22nd. Now we're ahead. We gained that distance back plus more. Wow. Now, I thought that the first year. I remember telling Steve, I think we're, we're, we're crossing. But once again, that's just what Jimmy was thinking because I seen the original cores, but we only pulled them one time. And I told Keith Burns, the green cover yesterday, I was in a conversation, and, and when people talk about, well, you can plant cover crops and use no moisture or be moisture ahead, everybody said, <laughs> you can't do that. But you gotta remember, when people tell you that, they're thinking traditional farming system. And if you're plowing that dirt three, four, five times a year, you're drying it out. And yeah, that, this system won't work that way. You gotta have a no-till system, but man, look at the difference. So when we get out there in the spring in a wheat crop, for instance, when we really need moisture, lo and behold, that's when I got it. Powerful, powerful data for me. But it's diversity and rotation has got to be the key. Yesterday we were in the beginning class and we, we talked a lot about cover crops and a lot of people said, well, what about planting rye? What about planting wheat? I can't think no longer about a cover crop being a single species because I believe that a monocultural system is where we failed. That's not the way the original prairie system was set up. Just think about that as we go along here. So here's a short wheat stubble crop. We're planting right behind the combine with my drill. We're going to plant a 15-way multiple species. You see sun hemp right there in the front. Look down in the understory. We've got a lot of, of plants that grow in the understory. But we still want to have a lot of tall plants up here. And look how cool that can be down in there. Matter of fact, it gets so big that it's hard to build an electric fence through there. So we'll, we'll have some mowing lanes. Darren and I have talked about this. We hate to have a mowing lane because when you shred that much biomass on the top, it, it disintegrates. I mean, you get down to where the the earthworms and the microbes can eat that up in a little, little short period of time. That's the reason we don't like choppers on the combines near like we used to like them. This is the same paddock. This is another thing that Steve talked me in. Always put some cool seasons in once in a while to see what will happen. So we've run a set of cattle through this and this is in about uh, November after a frost. You'll see it up here we've done stripped all the leaves off but look what happened when the canopy started opening up here come the forage collards a, a, a sweet surprise for a cattle grazer you know what i done i run another set of cattle back through there just lightly to graze the forage collars because they love them greens look at the manure on the ground look we got volunteer wheat 
and cool seasons coming back up. Now, we didn't, we didn't stay on that very long because we didn't have near the mass that we had to start with. But always, always do something out of the box. You'll never know how fast your car is going to go when you get a new one unless you try her out once in a while. Something totally new we tried this summer, and I want to apologize right up front. I've done a terrible job taking photographs this summer. Some good friends of mine up in Kansas have been doing companion cropping for quite some time. They've, they've really intrigued me. Sugarcane aphids has been a big issue in Milo. We wanted to put Milo back in the rotation, and this is, Milo is, is in this field. So we run another set of cattle through there, then we let that set through the winter to catch the snow, we planted early Milo. What you can't see there, and I'm gonna show you in a minute, we planted three pound of Milo, we planted three pound of buckwheat, we planted five pounds of mung beans and a pound of flax in fur in the row of Milo with a drill on 15 inch centers. Some people ask me why you plant flax. Well, look you right here. We're still blooming and the Milo's this far on. We want to attract the beneficials, insects in there to help us with the aphids. Look at this picture. You can see the buckwheat up in here. Mung beans over here. It's got flowers on them. Wow. We also plant, and I don't have a picture, I want to apologize. Keith probably asking, sitting in the audience somewhere. Where are you at, Keith? Right over there. How come you're not showing my pollinator strip, my flowering strip? We also plan to strip down the middle of the field that's 13 foot wide with all flowering species of about 20 different species and around three sides. And I was telling the guy earlier today, it's, it's almost mesmerizing when you went out there of a morning or late of an evening to listen to the buzz and the hum of all the insect activity that was in that strip. But it never failed when I went, went out there that we didn't see some activity on the flowers of the buckwheat or the flax or the mung beans. Whoops. Guess what happened? I didn't have to spray for any aphids. I didn't have to spray for any headworms. I didn't have to do anything. Now, that doesn't mean that I can repeat that this coming year. But that's a powerful first year start. The neighbors that was closest to me had to spray once. One guy had to spray twice. This Milo made 58 bushels at my house, which is on top of a red hill, about one of the highest points in Dewey County. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's not near as good a Milo as, as I could have up here in Kansas. It's, no, it's not, because I heard record yields this year, probably 100 more bushels than that. But in Oklahoma, where we're at, that's a pretty darn good start for us. I think we can do a lot better. I think we learned a lot. We're going to tweak on that system this year, and I want, I want everybody to be paying attention. I get lots of calls, lots of interest in this. But I'm not prepared to tell you today, if you go do this, that you're not going to have to spray. Because I don't know the threshold that's going to be coming this year. I will say I think it's got a lot of merit and a lot of potential that, that we can be successful at this. Because I'm not the only guy that's trying this. So I'll keep, I'll keep you posted on that. But I, I think it's, it's a lot of companion cropping we're going to see. I'm thinking about now doing that in the wheat. And we'll, we'll start working on that as we go. I love planting into heavy residue. And I love it standing. This is some that we grazed. Then we, we let it regrowth. That's a 6190 John Deere tractor that's almost hood high. When I done that that year, my father-in-law thought I was an idiot. He didn't say, Jim, you're an idiot, because Jack would never do that. But I could tell he was thinking about that, because my father-in-law was just like my dad. He's always been a clean tiller. I will tell you that this past summer, 
he sold all his equipment and bought a brand new no-till drill after he saw what we've been doing. So Steve, we are winning. And he's so excited now. He just loves going out. He said, I don't have any earthworms yet. I wonder what, what's going on. You got earthworms everywhere. And I said, Jack, just give it a time. Because it's not going to happen overnight. It's the three-year rule. The first year you're going to think, crud, this is a disaster. The second year you're going to say, well, it's a little better. And then the third year you're going to say, I'm on the right track and it's just getting better and better and better. This is another project that I stole from Robin up in Kansas. I don't see Robin here today. I saw him earlier. They've been doing a lot of uh, sunflower, Hurston sunflowers off the top. In a, this is a nine-way species. And I, just want, I didn't plant a full rate of sunflowers. I just wanted to tinker around with it and see if that was possible. And I could have harvested these flowers. But because I didn't have a full rate, I went ahead and killed it. And I'm going to drill a wheat crop back in there. I originally was trying this for canola because I wanted a black residue instead of a yellow residue or light colored residue that, so it would absorb heat in the winter so I wouldn't have as much winter kill on the canola. But remember, this was all happening during the drought and it didn't rain in time to plant canola. So I planted wheat. Now, if you'll notice over there on the left hand of the screen, once again, very painfully, I left a strip out. This particular landlord never really wanted to cover crops to start with. And he said, whatever you do, don't plant milo or a feed in this because that's hard on the soil. My dad always told me not to do that. So this scenario fitted. I could, I could get by with it because I didn't violate what he said. So we planted this, this particular species. Now look what happened through the winter. And, I, and when it snows in Oklahoma, we can get a lot of snow. We can get a little snow. But I will guarantee you if it's snowing, it's blowing. And every time we do this, look what happens. I had another field, that original field that we saw there a while ago, it was a north-south strip. I donated about this much snow to my neighbor off of that strip. But everywhere I had the cover crop, look what happens. and catch snow. Now remember what the topic of today is, is retention of water. Now that's not a lot of snow right there, but it's water. But look what happened when spring comes. Now we'd run a pretty good set of heifers through here that is going to an Angus sale. But look at the color. I don't know if y'all can see that out there very good or not. Look at the yellow. Now you see some cow pies in there and you'll still see a little green greening up. Now everyone at home would tell you you're short of nitrogen. And wouldn't that make sense if you had an all legume heavy Broadleaf crop in there, you would think, hmm, yeah, I'm creating nitrogen outside that and not inside, and so I'm short of in. If you run a green seeker over that, it's going to tell you that you're going to need some in. Not necessarily. So when spring came, look what started happening. Now, some of my neighbors and friends that think Jimmy is a total lost his mind would say well he's getting a pretty good crop it's starting to it's getting so big it's laying over and look there there's 30 foot strip through there can you see that plain as day so another one of my partners keith burns came to do a, do a talk for us in dewey county i took him down there that day and said look here keith what's happening he said i don't know have you pulled tissue samples yet I hadn't thought of that. So we pulled tissue samples right away to try to figure out what was going on. Now, meantime, this wheat crop is looking tremendous. This is really good. And like I said, some of them said, well, that wheat's better. That wheat's better in that strip because you didn't have all that moisture going out. Look at the heads here. 
Can you tell the difference? I can. So we got the results back. If you look at these numbers up here, nitrogen is about the same. Now we're in May, we're not very long from harvest. So we would expect our nitrogen to be low. But look at the numbers out there. Not a lot of difference. All the way down the chart until where? Our micronutrients. We're low on zinc, we're low on copper, and look at the difference in iron. But if you look at all the numbers over here on the left, there's not a lot of difference there. The only difference is in the micronutrients that help that crop stand up. I will tell you the yield data showed about a 10 bushel difference. That wheat outside the strip made about 80, right at 80. And we're here in the 69, 70 bushels in the strip. Wow. So most people tell me that a cover crop, how are you going to justify the expense? It's going to take all my water, and how am I going to plant in the residue? That's the three biggest questions I get. Now you've seen what we've been able to do drilling in the residue. Uh, hopefully that you will concede that looks like it's not going to use that much moisture because we're going to retain that back. But here's a way that we, we can capture some of them dollars back. Here's another field close to our headquarters. We're planting cover crop there. Look how fast this grows. And now that's a challenge when you're grazing because you've got to do a lot of planting in advance and then paddock size has got to change as you go through that because look how rapidly it can grow. We didn't graze this field because this is a new farm that joins our headquarters and has been clean till since the beginning of the plow. This, this older farmer passed away, he, him and his son passed away due to cancer. This is another partner, that's Paul with NRCS on the left. That's Jim Johnson with Noble Foundation on the right at a field day. The day that Paul and I took that, that week four, we sprayed that field with Roundup, only Roundup, a quart. This was a field day, Jim was here, we were digging. Look how tall that residue still is. Here we are drilling into that. Now I'm telling you, my granddad, there wasn't a drill in the 20s and 30s that could handle that. And actually, I call the daughter that I went to school with at this farm, and I said, you know, you put a lot of faith in me, and I'm wondering what your dad would think today if he come driving by. And she said, well, my dad hated the soil blowing. He hated it washing away. I think you're accomplishing that. But look at the biology. I know my system's working, because look there on the right. Where'd the residue go? I did not plow it. I did not shred it. Look at that. I'm telling you, when you go out there, that biology and them earthworms, they are working. And you know what, they work for free. I don't have to burn diesel and pull a, a plow to accomplish that. Look at that wheat. That particular year we made 58 bushels. The system correctly set up will work. And I don't care, I've spoken in New Mexico, I'm helping guys out there in a 10 to 12 inch rainfall. I've got a good friend here from Nowata, Oklahoma, somewhere he's probably in another meeting that's trying to plant a cover crop to use water because he's in, in a, a heavy rainfall area. The system will work, but look at the armor on the ground. You better believe we had a three inch rain last week. That is not gonna move any soil. There is no damage from a, a 
raindrop hitting the soil and breaking the aggregation up. Jay Fuhr come down the year before last. We done a round robin in Oklahoma. Jay wanted to come to my farm, and so after one of the sessions, we went out and Jay dug this up. There on the right, 